the Exodus chapter 3. I've got an unusual title for my message today, but I like to throw you all a curveball every once in a while. How many have seen that movie? That I know Mom has, but how many others have seen that movie with Kevin Klein called In and Out? In and Out, right? You've seen that? That's the title of my message this morning, In and Out. And believe me, it doesn't have anything to do with the movie, but you, you'll see. Exodus chapter 3, beginning at verse 1, if we stand in honor of the reading of God's word, I'm simply going to read through verse 6. The King James text reads, Now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the backside of the desert and came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. And Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush is not burnt. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called unto him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here am I. And he said, Draw not nigh hither. Put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. When you're in the presence of God, you're on holy ground. Do you know that? Moreover, he said, I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. What an experience, huh? What a marvelous experience. This man had one of the most unique experiences with and revelations of God that any human being would ever have. But wait until you see what the Lord has to say to us today about in and out. Amen. Would you pray with me? Master, we thank you, God, for this day. We thank you, Lord, for your word, for it's exalted above all else this hour. It's a love letter from heaven to humanity. And God, we pray today, Lord, that you would anoint the lips of your servant. God, help me to deliver this word with the same fervor and enthusiasm that I felt as you gave it to me. Lord, that the people of God might be encouraged this hour. Lord, that they might uh, believe in you even greater and trust in you even stronger. Master, this hour, let your presence and your power fall upon this place. Be in every heart and every hearer. Lord, that we might be anointed to receive the engrafted word, for we ask it today in none other than Jesus' precious name. Amen. Praise God and amen. You may be seated this morning. Moses feared to look upon the burning bush, for he knew he was in the very presence of God. But God was more than just a voice that spoke from the flame that appeared in that bush, and yet it did not consume that bush. God was far more than just a voice that came out of that bush. The fact of the reality is today that God was the flame. Amen. Do you hear me now? I said God was the flame. In Deuteronomy 4.24, the word of the Lord tells us, For the Lord thy God is a consuming fire, even a jealous God. And in Hebrews 12 and 29, Paul the writer repeats saying, For our God is a consuming fire. But when we read in Deuteronomy that our God is a consuming fire, even a jealous God, what is that speaking of his uh, consuming? What is that speaking of uh, the Lord consuming by reason of his fire? Well, he's a jealous God, so any false God is burned up and consumed in his presence. Amen. But the reality is today, as Moses looked upon that bush, he was looking into the very face of God. If you had seen the last, the most recent Harry Potter movie, which we just recently saw, and it was quite interesting, uh, there's one scene there where a character appears, 
and his face appears in the fire. Do you remember that? Well, as I was seeing that, I was thinking of my message. I said, isn't that interesting? Because that, in a sense, is how I would imagine God appearing to Moses out of that burning, fiery uh, bush. You know, I could just see some semblance of a face appearing in the midst of all that. But our God today was the flame that Moses looked upon. And our God today is more than just the fourth man in the fiery furnace. Listen to me now. He is more than just the fourth man in the fiery furnace when we face trials like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did in Daniel chapter 3. He's more than the fourth man in the fire. He is the fire. Hallelujah. Our God is the fire. He's not only there with us, but glory to God. He's the flame that's there not to consume us, but to purify us and to make us better. Hallelujah. Because even though we go in the flame, he plans on our coming out. It's in and out. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were not in the fire of the burning uh, furnace by accident or torment of the enemy. They were there by God's divine design. It was God's plan and God's purpose that they stand in that fire to show the king who God really is. Hallelujah. Sometimes we face the fire in our life so that people around us can see just who God really is. And they say, man, Donna's been through hell and back, but she keeps on moving. Charles has been through hell and back, but he keeps on moving. Juan has been to hell and back, but he keeps on moving. Every time he goes in the fire, he comes out. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Because that fire is not there to consume and destroy us. That fire is the presence of God in our lives. Hallelujah. Whoo, glory. The fires we face in our lives are not always the work of the enemy. Sometimes they are the kiln used by the potter to strengthen and complete us. Sometimes they are the furnace used to bring hard, cold steel down to its most pliable and giving form. Amen. It liquefies steel so that it can be formed and fashioned as the maker desires to fashion it. And sometimes that fire is, yes, it is. Sometimes the fire uh, is the flame used by the blacksmith to make his work more pliable and giving. Amen. So you see, sometimes we need fire in our lives. <laughs> sometimes we're cold and hard, and God has to put us in a little fire to get us to soften up so he can make us what he wants to be. Amen. Sometimes God has to purify us. Sometimes he has to liquefy us. Because the only way you can get impurities out of gold, you can't just reach in with a tweezer and pull out impurities. No, you have to liquefy it. And the impurities will come to the top, and then you can skim them off the top. And what you're left with is pure gold. Because gold is heavy. So the weight even of liquid gold is heavier than the impurities, and the impurities float to the top. So you see, sometimes we need fire in our lives. Sometimes God needs to bring and allow fire to come to our lives so that we can become what he desires for us to be. But our God is both the fourth man in the fiery furnace, comforting and strengthening us as we go through the difficult process of trials and testing. But he is also the very walls of flame that engulf us bringing about his divine purpose and his eternal end. Hallelujah. Many love to look back on the past and remember the experiences they've had in the furnace, often equating these experiences with satanic attacks or oppressions of the enemy. But, friend, we defang the enemy. Oh, you got to hear this now. We take the teeth right out of the devil, and we leave him standing toothless, and powerless when we acknowledge with Moses 
that our God was not just in the fire with us, but He was the fire. Devil, you weren't the fire. You didn't burn me. God was the fire. He wasn't there to hurt me. He was there to help me. Hallelujah. When he gave you the okay to put me through the trial, he did so, so that when it's all said and done, I will come forth as pure gold. Glory to God. I'm going to be better on the other side of this flame than I was going in. Hallelujah. Glory to God. We go into the furnace so that we can come out. <laughs> Hallelujah. And when you get out, stop revisiting the experience of the furnace. Listen to me now. Stop going back. Well, growing up with my daddy, yada, 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 and doing this and experiencing that. Oh, I went through this and I went through that. Stop revisiting the experience of the furnace as that only causes us to relive the pain and the terror. No, once you're out, it's time to just praise God that, the, that he brought us through. Hallelujah. We went in. We came out. Hallelujah. Glory to God. I don't have to talk about the furnace. The reality is one. I went in. I came out. Hallelujah. I'm out of it now. Glory to God. And I can tell you, if you're in the furnace this morning, you will come out. Hallelujah. I've been there. Glory to God. And I can tell you, God is faithful. You will come out of the fire. Glory to God. Job recognized that not only was God with him in his calamity, but he recognized that the Lord was the very fire that tried his soul. Look at how he stole the glory from Satan and placed all praise at the feet of the Lord when Job said, in Job chapter 1, verses 20 and 21, Then Job arose and rent his mantle, and shaved his head, and fell down upon the ground, and worshipped, and said, <laughs> Whoo, glory! Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, listen, he didn't say, and the devil took away. He said, and the Lord hath taken away. Oh, but blessed be the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Oh, how the devil got a black eye when Job simply took all the credit for his calamity away from the devil and said, no, sir, God gave and God took away, and I'll bless him anyway. Hallelujah. Oh, glory. How do you like that now? <laughs> Whoo! He said, my God is this fire. This fire ain't nothing else or nobody else but my God. And when I'm in, I'm in. But, baby, I'm coming out. <laughs> Hallelujah. Listen to Job in Job 13, verses 13 through 18, speaking to some of those around him. Hold your peace. Let me alone that I may speak, and let come on me what will. Wherefore do I take my flesh in my teeth and put my life in mine hand? Though he slay me, oh, yet will I trust him. <laughs> Though he slay me, oh, Job never one time said, though the devil slay me, oh, I'll still trust God. No, he said, though he slay me, because Job knew the fire he was in was God's fire. He was not there by accident. He was there by design. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. He goes on to say, but I will maintain mine own ways before him. He also shall be my salvation, for an hypocrite shall not come before him. Hear diligently my speech and my declaration with your ears. Behold now, Job says, I have ordered my cause. I know 
that I shall be justified. <laughs> oh, hallelujah. Stephen, when you face the fires of the furnace, understand this. <laughs> Number one, you may be in today, but you will be out tomorrow. Hallelujah. You will come out of the furnace. Hallelujah. And you will be untouched and unharmed and be like Job and know that God will be my salvation and know like Job I know that I shall be justified hallelujah talk about a man of faith huh Job knew he said honey he didn't say that one after he got out of the flames he said it while he was in the flames he said I know that my God will be my salvation, and I know that I shall be justified. It may not look too good today, but tomorrow is a new day, and God will see to it that in the end I am justified. Oh, glory to God. We always seek to lay blame. We always want to identify the culprit as the enemy seeking to vex us. But that is giving the enemy of your soul far too much credit and far too much power. Recognize today that you are God's child. Hallelujah. You are under his protective care. There is not a fiery trial or a hot tribulation that can come your way except that the master has first uttered the words to Satan, have you considered my servant Donna? Hallelujah. Have you considered my servant Tommy, glory to God. There's not a trial come your way that God first hasn't bragged about you. Glory to God. Whoo, hallelujah. You're under God's protective care. There's no safer place in the world to be. Whatever your trial, you're going in today, but you're coming out later. Luke 21, 16 through 18. And ye shall be betrayed both by parents and brethren and kinsfolk. And friends, and some of you shall they cause to be put to death, the Lord says. And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. But there shall not an hair of your head perish. Hallelujah. In your patience possess ye your souls. The Lord says every hair on your head is numbered. And there's not a hair on your head that is going to go up in the flame, Juan. It's not a single hair on your head going to burn up. There's not a hair on your head going to be singed. There's not a hair on your head going to fall out. If you went into the flames with 2,400,000 strands of hair, you're going to come out with 2,400,000 because in the flame you will, lo you will lose nothing. Hallelujah. The Lord also says in John chapter 10, verses 27 through 30, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. When you're in his protective care, you're safe. <laughs> when you're in God's protective care, you can know there isn't a Rosansky, there isn't a daddy, there isn't a devil that can do you harm. There isn't a devil or anybody on this planet that can pluck you out of the master's hand. Hallelujah. And then i got to give a little lesson on the oneness real quick. Because the Lord goes on to say, My Father which gave them unto me is greater than all. And no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. So he brings it around and makes it clear. He says, on one hand, you ain't going to pluck them out of my hand. Then he said, my Father, who's greater than everything. Well, of course he is, because God is invisible as God, and he's greater than a, a man, a single human being. He said, you ain't going to take them out of his hand either. He said, I've got news for you. He and I are one. We're the same. Amen. The word of the Lord promises us something. This is a wonderful promise. It's funny. I think sometimes we look at this portion of Scripture and we don't see it as a promise. I think we kind of hope it's so, but we don't see it as a promise. 
But Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 10, 11 through 13, Now all these things happened unto them for ensamples, and they are written for our admonition, upon whom the ends of the world are come. He's speaking of the experiences of the children of Israel in the wilderness. He said all those things were written as an example for us. He said, Wherefore let him that thinketh he stand take heed lest he fall. Then he says, There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that ye may be able to bear it. Mother, that's a promise today. What is Paul saying? We read the word temptation, but really, in this context, what they're saying in the original Greek is not temptation here. Go ahead, have a donut, have a donut, have a donut. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about there is no trial, there is no struggle that will overcome you. He said, but God automatically builds in a stress relief valve, just like the old-fashioned pressure cookers. If the pressure gets too great, that little valve popped out. Because God is never going to put you ever in something you can't handle. How do you like that? Say, Lord, this trial I'm going through, God, it tearing me up. And we've got to understand, the Lord's already promised us. He said, I will never put you somewhere that you can't handle. I'm not saying it won't stress you. I'm not saying it won't test you. But I'm telling you right now, if I've put you there, if I've allowed the enemy to try you in that way, it's because I have every confidence in you that you can make it. I know what you can do, and I know what you can't do. And I wouldn't even dare put you in a situation where the possibility existed for failure. Hallelujah. This passage does not tell us that God always allows for some way to escape the torments of a trial. But rather it says to us that God is in control. And there is not one trial that can even begin to overcome us. For God will not allow us to face a trial that we are not capable of overcoming. Oh, hallelujah. You want to give the devil a black eye this morning? Give God the praise in every circumstance. Ignore every involvement that he may have. Ignore the fact the devil may be involved. Don't give him no credit. Don't say, no, well, the devil's doing it again. The devil's attacking us. The devil. Every time you do that, you're giving him praise. Every time you do that, you're giving him credit and praise. Amen. Don't give the devil no praise. Amen. Listen, here's how you give them a black eye instead. 1 Thessalonians 5, 15 through 18, Paul writes, See that none render evil for evil unto any man, but ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves and to all men. Rejoice evermore, pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God, in Christ Jesus concerning you. And you've heard me talk about that in the past. What is the will of God for you? That you give thanks in everything. Amen. That's the will of God for you. And everything that comes your way is God's will for you. Do you hear me now? That's an important truth to learn today. Everything that comes your way is God's will for you. If it wasn't God's will for you, it wouldn't be happening. So just thank God for it and ignore the devil, act like he's not even involved. Sure, the only way God can, that evil can come into our lives is if the Lord allows the enemy to bring it. Because God can't do evil. Amen. And God, for that matter, doesn't bring temptation. The Bible said God is not a man. He can't be tempted, neither can he tempt. God can't tempt anybody because he can't be tempted. That's not his nature. That's not his personality. That's not who he is. So the, the Word of God is telling us that God allows the enemy sometimes to bring things our way, ultimately for our benefit. But he never lets him bring anything that we cannot survive. 
Hallelujah. Look at the experience of Paul and Silas in Acts 16, verses 25 and 26. Here they've been beaten and thrown into prison. And the Bible says, And at midnight Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God. And the prisoners heard them. Oh, they could have sat there and grunted and griped and said, Oh, the devil is attacking our ministry. Oh, the devil's trying to keep us down. Oh, the devil's trying to suppress us. Oh, the devil with the devil. They said, No, sir, we don't have anything to say about the devil. We ignore his involvement in the entire process, and we go straight to God and thank him and praise him for it, because somewhere, some how this is the will of God for my life to make me better. Hallelujah. God calls our trials to a quick close when we worship Him in spite of the circumstance. Remember Job? <laughs> Though He slay me, oh, yet I will trust Him. Amen. If we recognize that all these trials can do is work God's divine purpose in our lives, when the three Hebrew children emerged from the furnace, listen to what was said of them. Daniel 3, verses 24 through 27. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king was astonished, and rose up in haste, and spake, and said unto his counselors, Did not we cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? They answered and said unto the king, True, O king. He answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt. And the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. Then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the mouth of the burning fiery furnace and spake and said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, ye servants of the Most High God. <laughs> God had just done proven himself, so he knew how to address those boys. He said, Come forth and come hither. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came forth out of the midst of the fire, and the princes, the governors, and captains, and the king's counselors being gathered together saw these men, listen, upon whose bodies the fire had no power. Upon whose body the fire had no power. It may not have touched their body, but it purified their soul. Because the next time they had to face a trial, they say, you know what, I remember. I was in a furnace once, and the fire didn't even touch me. If I could believe God then, I can believe God now. Hallelujah. So you see, that fire affected them all right. It just didn't affect their body. But listen to this now. It also says, nor was an hair... Woo! Glory! On their head, singed. What did I tell you a moment ago? What did Jesus say? He said, not one hair of your head will be destroyed. Not one hair of your head will be troubled. Come on now. And then listen to this. Neither were their coats changed. In other words, they didn't discolor. They didn't get smoky. <clears throat> nor the smell of fire had passed on them. When you come out of the fire, if you'll stop visiting it, <laughs> if you'll stop visiting the furnace, guess what? Nobody will even smell it on you. They'd never know you'd ever been there. People look and say, you mean to tell me that you had an abusive father and he treated you as badly as all that? And la, 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 la. I would have never known to look at you. I'd have never known because I didn't smell smoke. Amen. You hear me now. I didn't smell the smoke in your clothes. I didn't have any idea that you had passed through that kind of fire because I couldn't smell it on you. You may have enemies today, this is my final thoughts, who are stoking the flames in an effort to destroy you. But with every blast of air or every cord of wood they add to the flames to make the fires hotter, listen to this, the presence of God rises higher and higher because the fire is our God 
and our God is the fire. So when they stoke the flames of tribulation, and when they stoke the flames of trials and uh, tribulation, the reality is the presence of God grows greater and greater and greater around us. Hallelujah. You've heard me talk about the fact that in the last days, you're going to see God's church return to the old-time miracle-working church it was in the book of Acts. Why? Because the church is going to fall under great tribulation and judgment. And when you turn up the heat, what have I told you? God's church all of a sudden gets to moving. All of a sudden they start doing things the way they're supposed to be doing things. Because when the enemy tries to turn up the heat, it works against him. Because the only fire that ever surrounds God's people is God's fire. So every time the enemy turns up the heat, he winds up turning God's presence in your life up higher and higher and higher and higher. My Lord, have mercy. Children, don't fear the fire you face today, for you will survive and you will see tomorrow. You will have more faith. You'll have greater faith. You'll have stronger faith for having endured the flames that you faced today. Or for many of us, those we faced yesterday. <laughs> many of us in this room stand here today victors, not victims, of fires that tried to destroy our lives and devastate our faith. But I'm here to tell you today, I was in the fire, but now I'm out. Hallelujah. I've been in the furnace. But today I'm out. Glory to God. You may be in the fire this morning, but take it from one who has been there. You will emerge the victor. Hallelujah. You will be better and stronger for having endured the flames. Do not lose hope. Your God is not only in the fire with you, He is the fire. What the enemy has meant for evil, God will turn to your good. You remember the story of Joseph in the Old Testament, and he endured the flames of jealousy and the torments of his brothers, finding himself in a place where he was finally able to save and sustain not only those brothers who had tormented him, but his entire family. Listen to what Joseph said, and I'm closing right now. Genesis 50, verses 19 and 20. And Joseph said unto them, Fear not. He's talking to his brothers. This is after they discovered he was the Pharaoh's servant that they were talking to about needing food and needing uh, some help during the struggle they were going through. And Joseph said unto them, Fear not, for, I, for am I in the place of God? He said, I'm not God. Don't worry. I'm not, I'm not going to judge you. I'm not going to criticize you. I'm not going to condemn you for what you did. He said, But as for you, you thought evil against me. You turned up the fires against me. You made the fire as hot as you could make it against me. But God meant it unto good. Hallelujah. Every time you turned up the fires against me, the presence of God rose up in my life higher and higher and greater and more powerful. He said, what, what did God mean to do? He said, but God meant it unto good to bring to pass as it is this day to save much people alive. Joseph recognized, I was in the fire, but now I'm out. No sense holding a grudge. I'm not there anymore. No sense being angry. I'm not there anymore. No sense crabbing and complaining and revisiting the flames. No, I'm not in the fire anymore. Why did God allow my daddy to treat me the way he did growing up so that I could be the compassionate, decent human being that I am now that can't even stand to see anybody go hungry, can't even stand to see anybody suffer, can't stand to see any child be abused? You see, God needs people like us in the world. God needs people who have a sensitivity to some of these issues in the world who are willing to take a stand and who are willing to do something when something needs to be done. Well, I could have been raised and my daddy could have been a lot more loving and my daddy could have been a lot more. That's right, he could have. But you know what? 
you wouldn't have a heart to see a child being abused and mistreated and realize, you know what, I've got to do something. Because I know from personal experience what it's like to have to be in a situation like that. I've been there, and it's not fun. And that child doesn't need to go through that. And if I've got to call uh, Child Protective Services or whoever I've got to call, I'm going to do what I've got to do. You understand what I'm saying? So you never know why. But God allowed every circumstance in your life, every fire that you've been through, God allowed so that you could be where you are today. And it would work to your good, and it would make you a more profitable, a more beneficial member of society as a whole. How's that? Amen. So listen, friend, today you may be in, but tomorrow you'll be out. Because every fire that you ever face, you can know a promise from God. It's in and out. You hear me now? It's in and out. Would you stand with me this morning? Amen. So how was that? Did you get something out of that? Praise God, I'll tell you. It's in and out. No trial, no tribulation you ever face is going to last forever. You're going to come out of it. You're going to come out of it, and you're going to come out of it better, stronger. Kind of reminds me of the old uh, bionic man lead in, you know, for the program. Better, stronger, this and that. But I just want to play in the background a little song that I love to, uh, there it is, okay. I love this old song because it says, Some through the fire, 